Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is Jim Hodds here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home to the most touchable warbirds in Texas. Uh, here today to interview Gary Goff. There's Gary this morning. Uh, we're glad that you, you've joined. I wanted to bring Gary in on, on this side uh, to interview him. Uh, some things that uh, he and I have talked about over the years is what it takes to actually become a pilot. Um, hi, Mike. Good to see you. Uh, what it takes. Now, I did, uh, I did uh, presentations for a long time to school groups, and I used to tell people it was the three Ds. Yet it was dedication, determination, uh, or desire, dedication, and determination. So, Gary, where did you first get your interest in, uh, in, in flying? I was, uh, my dad was a uh, bomber pilot uh, in uh, the late 50s, early 60s. I was born in 58. And uh, so we were on an Air Force base all my growing up days. And uh, it was real interesting. When I was old enough to understand what was going on on TV, my dad would let me watch this TV series based on the movie 12 O'Clock High called 12 O'Clock High. Uh, however, there was a before then called Peyton Place. And my dad considered it sed uh, seditious. He considered it just, it was a soap opera type TV show, but it was just not suitable for a young boy's mind. And so <clears throat> the only time I got to stay up past eight o'clock at night was 12 o'clock high, but I couldn't come in until after uh, the place was done. And after watching for a while, I told my dad, who was a bomber pilot, that the guys in the small airplane shooting at the guys in the big airplane looked like it's a lot more fun than the guys big airplane all those shots can I he said sure come does that look like a fun so how old were you then when you first I was start about eight ten years old and it just it it was interesting once I started on that once I said ooh this is what I'd like to do because it looks fun uh, everything I did as a kid, I started building models. Uh, my dad would take me to the Air Force Base and look at all the airplanes that showed. Up. I, uh, I just surrounded myself with aviation ideas, uh, specifically military. I didn't, I didn't have any idea about uh, airline pilots. I just wanted to fly military, and specifically, I wanted to fly fighters. So, when was the first time you actually flew in an airplane? Not like a commercial airplane, but very interesting. My dad uh, was a pilot and he would fly to go uh, relatives because we lived all over the and it's so interesting because every time I got in an airplane I got sick. I mean like like throwing up sick like really bad sick. The same way in a car. I got car sick all the time. Then when I was 17 or 17 first pilot lesson my dad was my which is a uh, and that was the last time I'd thrown up. Once I started learning to fly, everything and I can't figure it out. I never got car sick again. I never got air sick again. It was, it's, it's interesting how that works. But boy, I tell you, it is intense, I think. Some people would say that because it's emotion sickness, emotion sickness is rare. Interesting. And that when you are in a position that you are controlling the machine, yes. Uh, that kind of goes away. So yeah, I could never be a leader. I could never be a navigator. There's no way. You are so close with that. Be operating the jet. That's it up. so. When uh, wanting to do, it, starting to formulate a plan to go in the military, and have to go to college or whatever. When did that? It was. It was very interesting. The first I started flying. Uh, My dad started to me fly. So interesting. He was the base ops commander in uh, Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport, Bossier City, Louisiana. And um, I was a big, big, big fan of the Bald Eagle. And at the time, the F-15 was a brand new airplane. In 1976, I think, 75, they showed up at Barksdale, a four ship. And my dad called me, and I got in my car, and I drove over there as fast as I could, and he took what was so cool because your dad's a lieutenant colonel and your dad has all these military passes and your dad could do these things he took me out on the flight line and i got to see these airplanes and at that moment it was sealed the there was no doubt about it i was going to do whatever it took 
I was going to pay whatever price, I was going to work whatever it required, because I wanted to go fly fighters, because when I saw the physical fighter, it changed the world. It's like if you, the people that come out here and they see these airplanes and they actually touch them, it changes you. It really does. What age again? I graduated from high school in 1970, and I knew I had to get a commission to get into the Air Force because the Air Force had the F-15. <clears throat> My other choice was the uh, Marine Corps, uh, but they didn't have the F-15. So I thought, okay, I want to go fly in the Air Force. And so uh, I knew I had to get into it. I had to have a four-year degree. You have to have a four-year degree to be able to be a pilot. I, I researched all this stuff. Of course, I had your dad there. He, I knew all the steps that you had to do to get to pilot training. And one of the big steps was you had to get accepted into a, uh, a four-year school. You had to have a four-year degree. And <clears throat> for me, it was an ROTC program at Texas A&M is where I went. It's called the Corps of Cadets. But I started taking military science classes, and that was were the classes that were required for you to get a contract to go into the Air Force, especially in training. Okay, were, were you guaranteed education at any of those points in time? Once I got, let's see, it would have been the end of my sophomore and beginning of my junior year of college, I got accepted. And my grades were high enough, that's another thing. You had to have a 3.0 or higher in college, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, you had to do uh, uh, public service things. I had to do things with uh, uh, community service type stuff. I had to have a, a kind of a resume, if you will, and they accepted all of that, and I got a contract, and I signed the contract that uh, gave me a scholarship for my last two years and a pilot slot, a slot in pilot training uh, sometime whenever I graduated, and that's how I knew I was going to go fly in the aviation career at the Air Force. Now, would, would that have been? Specific to A and M, or do you think it was that way I everywhere? There, I think it's on all of the Air Force ROTC programs. You get an Air Force; it's a uh, pilot contract. Okay, as I a, remember, as an ROTC contract, because yes, uh, I was in the Marine Corps platoon leader class program. And I had an aviation guarantee, yep. uh, but it wasn't required that I particular grade point. Uh, those kinds of things. So I guess it's different service, than service, and probably right. today may be different than. What and it was very competitive at A&M. Okay. So I think that's the reason why they had you such a high grade point average because there were so many people trying to get these slots. They only had so many slots, even there were a whole bunch of guys who still wanted to get in. So did, did you have anybody, I mean, other than your dad, did you have anybody who was a mentor that helped you through this process? Uh, that's a great question. It, uh, my uncle uh, would have been my dad's sister's husband. My uncle was a bombardier on B-52. And so I was all around military aviation. And my uh, dad's roommate in college, who was my uncle, flew F-105 out of uh, into Vietnam. So he was a fighter pilot. So I had, I had this constant, um, I just was circled by these men that were huge aviation, huge military aviation. They just were very good at what they did. And so it was constant. That's all we all talked about. And so that, I, I guess you get yourself in the circle of friends, and that keeps you oriented, keeps your North Star, if, yeah. if you will, going. So that you, to me, that would have been a huge advantage. I had nobody. Your, you know, your story is phenomenal. Yeah, I, I had, it was all self-driven, but, and that's the thing that I find interesting. Everybody has a different story about how they, they, they got here and got there. So so let's go, uh, go to you. Uh, Graduate from A and M, and I'm assuming uh, you graduated and had orders to flight school. Flight school. I graduated in May, and my orders flight school was in November, right before Thanksgiving. Um, and I show, up, and it's very interesting. The instructor says we had I don't know 60 people, I guess, in our class. And where is this that you showed Del up? Del Rio, to? Texas. Del Rio. Okay. <clears throat> Del Rio, Texas. There's nothing in Del Rio. There's an Air Force base. Um, and he said, look to your left and look to your right says one of you will not be here to graduate and it it was like a shock it was like a okay you need to wake up and pay attention because of the three people <clears throat> excuse me one of us isn't going to be here when we graduate so whether it's because you can't hack it or because you say i can't take this anymore or because you just fail yeah and it was very um real at that moment 
that I've got to produce or I'm not going to graduate. It's, it's no longer want it. You're there now. And now the reality of what it's going to take to stay there. 11 months of training and intense training. That, what was the first airplane you flew in? First airplane was the T-37, which we're repairing here at the museum. Uh, and um, I just didn't like the airplane. Tell me. Oh, God, the first flight, we call it our dollar ride. We had to instruct our dollar and took us up, flew. And by the time we landed, I mentally was ready to take off. <laughs> you are so far behind the airplane. And you go, I am never going to catch up. This is never going to work. And interesting to note that once, once you start getting in the rhythm, once you go through simulator training, once you start getting, it, it just started clicking and clicking and you just, and you get up to speed. And by the time you're flying formation, um, you know, you just know at that moment that this is what I want to do. Some of the guys didn't want to do that. They wanted to fly transport aircraft or bomber aircraft. But once I got to fly on the wing and see what it was like to just sit there, I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. This is what I want to do is be a wing, is be on the wing. Formation flying seals the deal for a lot of people. It's just so foreign and it's so, it's such a rush, rush. to be able to do that. Oh my gosh. And then when we transition to the T-38 and you got to do afterburner takeoff, I'm and it just, it just, you light the burners, the airplane goes straight up like this to 30,000 feet. You're like, wow, now, I, I'm so far behind the airplane again, again, again. Now, did you have any idea when you were 38s where you would be going afterwards? It's about uh, at the formation phase, the completion of the formation phase, to make the decision if you're FF, FFR, uh, FAA, whatever it is. Fighter attack or reconnaissance, FAR. Okay. That's okay. It. That it, you have the the physical skill to be a fighter guy. If you don't have the physical skills, then you go to heavies. And so I, I knew in formation phase that I was going to be qualified fighters. I didn't know what my sign was until we were graduating. Okay, you're tall. You're yes, sir. How tall, how tall are you? I'm six three, six two to six. Okay. Was that ever a question in the air? Force? Yes. A uh, good friend of mine was 6'6", six, six, and they said, there's no way you're going to get to fly. At that, all? I, not transports, not, not trans anything. 6'5 is the limit to fly in the United States Air Force at that time. Okay. At that time. So, fortunately, I was a couple inches underneath it. And it's really interesting. And all the airplanes I flew, uh, this, this actual OB-10, my squadron, uh, you can get in, get out, no big deal. It, I had no problem sitting in this airplane. Same way with the uh, T-38. Yay, all the airplanes I flew. Now, I, there's no way I could have flown an A4. I don't know how you yeah. how you did it. There's this guy, this body I fit in an A4. There's well, no I'm, way. I was 5'10", and it was 5'10", uh, 5'11". Uh, and I think the, the height limit for the A4 was 6'1". Wow. Uh, because if you were taller than that, the problem was on an objection. Yeah. You, you'd get knee cap. That's what they said. That's so, the guys, technically, because of that uh, uh, guy either for healing or for squadron uh, after the OV. We had a guy who just met the minimums. <coughs> I just, okay. And we would stand in front of us. So so tell me about the your your T thirty eight experience. What about T thirty eight did you really love? When okay, you side by side. Okay. And the T spins. I'm not a merry-go-round kind of guy. I don't like spins. And uh, the guy could reach over and grab your oxygen, and he could play with you, and you know, do things. And once you sit in the T38, you're up front, and there's nothing, nobody. It's the jet and the structures back there in the back. And it was. I flew from even though yeah. it's just so odd because you you can't see them unless you really crank it around and see them kind of like the voice of god. of god that's exactly what i thought i thought oh, this is what the voice of god would be like and then the instructor said no it's me <laughs> and i went oh god i'm gonna be oh, make it i'm not gonna do it. um and you sit on a jet and they always said on the 38 most fast still 
and I mean, it's got it's got a small wing, it's got a thin wing, afterburners, and it, and it's sonic. That was the other thing. It's my first time to ever go speed of heat for Sonic. It was like <laughs> this is cool. That just kept. This is the best. So you you got uh, phases of flight. Did you get to everything was first was you had to learn how to how to fly the jet basically how to bring it back and land it um uh, how to to get it to a stall but not stall in the 37 you could stall it and fall because it's a straight wing big yeah. fat wing uh you learn all that and once you, and you got what's called a contact check uh you could fly contact in other words you could fly outside the airplane then you got an instrument check ride it means can you fly this airplane in the weather so that was when we sat in Back under the hood, okay. which is what you did in the TA4, yeah. right? So the students in the back, you're going, away. and then once you finish that, you're you're clear. Phase. Okay. Your first form phase. It's really funny. You come in there, the instructor brings you in, and then as soon as he lets you stick and you get it, you start. Yo, listen, just takes you a little bit because when we've talked about this many times, you and I both know it's it's just. Yeah. It's just a feel. You're not doing this. You're just doing little. And once the formation phase is done, you get you get qualified. The last phase, the very last phase, is your instrument ride. And the oldies is scariest because you have to pass the instrument ride because all throughout the whole phase, you're doing instruments in the simulator. You're doing instruments in the airplane. Everything. The very last ride to get your wing. Get my wings and pass the instrument check right. So, did you do air to air or air to no, ground? So, that no. was not all single ship. It's all single ship. Okay. So, at what point when you're in, referred to as advanced jets, did you start putting in your wish for what you want to fly and what did you put on? What, what was on your list? I'm telling you, the, the, um, because it changes from week to week. Right. You could be to the base. Right. And if there's no seats, you don't go. And for us, they had a whole bunch of guys that were fighter rated. Four fighters available. So everybody else went to heavies. Doesn't matter if you're qualified or not. Okay. That's all that was available in the system. So we as a class were like, oh. when we finally got to the point where we knew what was coming, so we knew that we had one F-16. It's one of the first times that you had an F-16 ride of pod training. We had uh, four F-15s, we had six F-4s, and we had a T-33 and an OV-10. <laughs> so we had this huge gambit. Yeah. Uh, and oh, and we had 10 instructor pilot slots where they'd come back to pilot and be what's called a FAPE, a First Assignment IP, F -A And so- and we called them- Yeah, we use that term too. And so you knew that, that the jet was out there for you. And I knew, and so, I, I I wasn't as good ranked in my class. That's another thing. Throughout pilot training, you, some guys are just born with it. And some guys like me have to work their butts off, man. I didn't I wasn't born with natural stick. I had to work at it the whole way. But you never you had to keep working at it, working at it. You would fail here, and then you have to redo it, and you'd fail again and you redo it, and you keep pressing and you keep pressing, and you keep working, and sure enough, come down to the end. I was able to get a fighter, which was the OB-10, which I was just thrilled to death to get. And I remember getting it, because uh, I forgot about it in the assignment, and you, you had it, you took a shot of whiskey with the colonel there, and I looked at him, I, the, the F-4s were gone, I thought I'd get an F-4, and I forgot about this thing. And I said, can I have another one? Can I take another one? I salute him, I turn, and then behind me they show the picture of the airplane. And I get an OB-10, and I just German and go, This was your airplane right out of flight school. Right out of flight school. I get to go through this. I was just unbelievably thrilled. I get to go to Germany because that's where Simbach is. Okay. And I, I was, I think I was happier than the guy who got the F-16. Interesting. Because he knew he was going to get it, I think. So then how long did you fly the, uh, the old? Three years. Okay. And then I did very did, well. how did you manage to go to F-15? We, uh, the, the guys that were finishing up their tour of duty, uh, well, we were a bunch of six of us. And they had uh, an F-16, a couple of F-15s, a couple F-4s, and F-111. And so um, I didn't want to fly the F-16. I 
want to fly the F-15. That was been my dream at the time. And so then uh, there was uh, both F-15s were to Japan. And so I was fortunate enough that I was high that the squadron commander gave me the F-15. And so I was able to go do that. So I was very, very thrilled. The, this is my OV-10 patch. Okay. That's my squadron I flew in the OV-10. And then that's the squadron I flew when I flew F-15s. Okay, so how long total were you in the Air Force? I did eight years. Eight And did you leave because you didn't want to fly in the Air Force any longer? Or you wanted to go to the airline? No, I did it for the family. Okay. I was married and had kids. And I thought, ah, I've got to go do a remote bureau. I've got to go do all this. I'm going to be gone. I said, yeah, I've got, I went to the top of the mountain. What else is there left to do for me? And um, the guy, my uncle, my dad's roommate that flew F-105s, he was a uh, American Airlines pilot, and he had strongly recommended that I fly for the airlines. And he, and so you enjoyed your airline time too? Yeah, uh, 32 years, 30 years, 32 okay. years, something like that in okay. the airlines. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're running up close to the end of our time, so if anybody's got uh, please go ahead and ask them now while uh, while we still got uh, we still got Gary here. Uh, everybody's got a different story. Everybody gets there. Do you regret any of it? No. Um, if you had to do all over again, we still go through what everything yes. it took all through being a, a young kid and being a teenager and what it took in college to get to fly military airplanes. I was kind of an odd man in high school, odd teenager, because I knew I wanted to go see the world, and I wanted to go fly airplanes. I wanted to fly jets, and it was worth it. It was definitely worth it. The military experience, you learn so much. Um, wow, your character develops, and the leadership you learn, and then flying in the airlines, my gosh, being a captain of an airline uh, with 140 or 300 passengers, whatever you've got back there, the responsibility that's on you and the decisions that you make are, uh, it, it's, an, it, it's an infinite experience. You can't, you can't limit the experience that I've received and the training and the knowledge and the wisdom you gain from doing that, this kind of job of flying airplanes, flying airliners, and then uh, applying to regular life. Oh, we were talking about this earlier. We don't really get nervous when things start happening because we've been trained to just analyze. What is it? The, when we, whenever there's an emergency, it's uh, fly the airplane, fly the airplane, fly the airplane, uh, analyze, take the appropriate actions, fly the jet. Yeah. You know, those kind of things. It, it, it is a wonderful experience that is so difficult to even explain or capsulize into words that I would tell everybody, if you have any desire to fly airplanes, I would man, run with it because you learn so much and you become very stable in, in your ability to make decisions and, and then go. So do you think that's your big takeaway from not flying airplanes in your day-to-day -day life, the way you yeah. analyze your life for yeah. challenges and things like that? You can analyze the situation when everybody's going, bing, 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 bing. And you can sit there and go, no. That's the other thing. You learn to say no. That is a great, great experience to say, no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to go there. Because it's not, it, we just, we can make a decision. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing to say, no, we're not going to do that. Well, we've run up against our time here. I'd like to, Gary, thanks for, for doing this today. Thank you for letting um, me do it. This is a good, uh, a good inspirational piece for kids because if everybody needs to find out that if you want to be a pilot bad enough, you can. And everybody's path to doing that is different. Yes. And it's rewarding. You won't do it. You know, you'll just kind yes. of get out of it somewhere along the line. You'll just yes. not. This is not in it for me. And it's not easy. Nope. You it's not have easy. to work at this constantly. This is not something time one shot deal go like this and just do a bunch of taps like this and life is good. This is something that requires a significant amount of your attention. To well, once again, thank you folks for, for joining us today. We uh, hope you're staying well. You had a good uh, Christmas and holidays and that that'll continue for the, uh, for the next week. So from the uh, Fort Worth Aviation Museum, uh, I'm Jim Hodson with uh, Gary Goff and uh, have a good afternoon and a good week.